Amen. Sometimes you just need to pray, you know? There is a whole lot of power moving back and forth in that little circle. I was joking with Tiffany and said, and notice that I didn't reference the Care Bear stare. I should have, because that's what was happening. It was Care Bear action. Don't worry, we went and watched the Care Bears to make sure we were right. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Did you watch the Care Bears? Yes, so like the Care Bears, see now I'm on a roll. The Care Bears all have their own individual powers, right? And then sometimes, not all the time, sometimes it requires all of them to line up and use their individual powers to create one big force. See, the Care Bears, they're powerful beings. And that's what I feel like. It's our job, as those who know, is to do the Care Bear stare. Anyway, it's fine. <laughs> Guys, we're going to, let's just, can we just journey through the book of Esther together? I mean, part of me feels like the responsible thing would be to read it, but then I feel like maybe we'd miss out because it's boring to listen to people read sometimes. And this is already my second teaching today, and I'm kind of tired. <laughs> so you may get more out of me <laughs> if I just tell you the story, right? Is that okay? Okay. So, and this is really important. The story of Esther is really important for us to grab hold of because Esther's a nobody. Hadassah, that's her name. She's a nobody. In fact, she's an orphan. She's an orphan. Her uncle adopts her, right? And worse than that, she's Jewish, living in a foreign country. She's less than nothing except she has a pretty face, right? It actually says that she has a pretty face. Man, those barbecued Smokies are really strong smelling. <laughs> like catching a, a whiff of them. Anyway, I'm super distracted tonight. It's fine. Um, so the story starts off with King Xerxes having a party. And if you read through the first chapter of Esther, it is, goes into detail of everything that went into planning this party. He spared no expense for this party that he was putting on. And the, this party went on for days, for days. It wasn't like, I mean, shoot, I get exhausted after a Sunday, you know? But these people were party animals and they went days and days. And spared no expense. So you know there was a lot of wine. These parties had to have been crazy. Anyway, so the king gets a wild hair. And it's like, somebody fetched my wife. He calls for Queen Vashti, who's having her own party. Right? She and her ladies are tucked away somewhere having their own party. Who knows? It could have been more wild than what the king was doing. Anyway, so... The king sends for her, and she denies his request. She's like, I'm not going. Now, there's all kinds of things that we hear that is kind of read into the story, that this is actually what was happening. I don't know. All I know, plain and simple, Vashti refused to come. The king is so embarrassed and quite drunk, I'm sure, and makes a decision right then and there. Vashti is banished from my kingdom forever. The king is now without a wife. And what is a king without a queen, right? So, the, so he surrounds himself with noblemen who suggest, well, let's replace her. So all in one fell swoop, he goes from losing a wife to let's go and round up all the women in the kingdom, right? And what he's doing is creating his own little harem, <laughs> And he goes and, and he has all of the, the women. It's very, there's specifics behind this of who he wanted. And Esther is one of them. What we do have to understand is that she's taken against her will. This isn't like knock, knock, knock. Hey, would you like to be a part of the king's thing? 
It's not like that at all. It's more like a scene from Taken. We've talked about this. There, she's taken. She's not asked. Mordecai, her uncle, isn't asked, can I have her? The one thing that he did have a chance to say is, don't tell him where you're from. Don't tell them your heritage. The, the Jewish people are there against their will. They're spread out everywhere against their will. So what happens is she goes and she, she becomes part of this entourage of young women that are competing to be queen. And it's six months or 12 months of beauty treatments. Now I know you and I are like the spa for 12 months. Uh, sign me up, <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is forced. It's forced. I know beauty treatments for 12 months straight. So it's six months of being soaked in myrrh, right? I'm sure we could read into that, but we're not doing that right now. And then it's six months of, it says, beauty treatments and being soaked in perfumes. This is all to prepare them to go before the king. Each one of them individually are taken before the king and they have no idea when it's going to be their turn. Esther's turn comes and she's supposed to go before the king. And she's already won the favor of her um, assigned eunuch. And, and he, he gives her all kinds of advice before she goes. And she goes before the king and the king is taken with her. Decides right then and there, queen. That's queen. She will be my queen. That's Esther. She's the queen. So the whole thing is off. The competition has ended and Esther is crowned queen. So then what happens? Oh, hello. Then what happens is the king names a new right-hand man and his name is Haman. Haman is horrible. Say Haman is horrible. Haman's horrible. He's, he's not just horrible, but he wants to eradicate an entire people group. He wants them gone. He wants them off the face of the planet. And he actually tricks the king, subtly tricks the king into signing a decree that they could all be wiped out. What? Oh, see, I told you your voice carries. <laughs> And, and, and the king hands his signet ring over to Haman and says, make it happen. Because he's convinced the king that these people are bad. So Mordecai learns about this. And Mordecai rips his clothes. And he covers himself in ashes. And he begins to mourn. Mourn for his people. As he should. Right? Right? And then he sends word to Esther and tells her what is taking place. You've got to remember that Esther is likely a teenager. She's a queen, but she's a teenager, likely. And he tells her, Esther, you're our only hope. Right? I mean, basically, that's what he says. I want to read to you what, what he actually says to her, because this is crazy. And he, he sends this, it, it, they're sending messages back and forth to each other. And he says this, Esther, don't think that just because you live in the king's house, you're the one Jew who will get out of this alive. If you persist in staying silent at a time like this, help and deliverance will arrive for the Jews from someplace else but you and your family will be wiped out. Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for such a time as this. And we know that line. You don't have to spend very much time in church circles to hear, you were born for such a time as this. It's kind of our cliche go-to thing. But the part that I really want to highlight is the fact they said, if you persist in silence, help for our people is going to come from somewhere else. And what he's saying to her is, you're called, but if you're not going to step up, 
then God will raise someone else up to do it. What we don't understand is that on the backside of this story, this requires her to go before the king to get help, right? But you can't just show up in the king's space uninvited. It's death. And she says, John, I'll love this part. She wraps it up by saying, if I perish, I perish. <laughs> Did you hear him sing? <laughs> <laughs> it's super dramatic, but it's so true. It's so true. This was her reality that she could die. The king could have her killed for showing up uninvited. And so the tradition was that if you showed up before the king uninvited and he did not extend his gold scepter to you, you were to be killed. So Esther, I can't even imagine this moment. Honestly, I can't. I've had moments where my heart is racing. I mean, I just had a moment with my daughter because she had to come up here and welcome you all. And her heart was literally pounding. <laughs> and that's nothing like a life and death situation. <laughs> she didn't even know I was talking about her. <laughs> So she shows up, and the king is delighted to see her. He's delighted. He extends his scepter to her. And so she approaches him, and she says to him simply, I just want to have dinner with you. Could you and Haman join me for dinner tomorrow night? And the king is like, well, of course, right? So it's a whole setup where... Queen Esther is, she's trying, I think she's trying to like muster up the courage to get to the point because we do this, right? <laughs> Ladies, do we do this? <laughs> and so she, she has them and she's, she's, she's had everything laid out. It's a beautiful spread. And they're just enjoying their time together. And the king says to her, is there anything else that I can do for you, Esther? And he's like, she says, yes, have dinner with me again tomorrow night. <laughs> Right? We can win we can win people over with food. <laughs> it's important that we know how to cook. Anyway, just kidding. She probably had people to do that for for her. So they meet again the next night, and this particular night, she gets super brave and she tells King Xerxes exactly what is going on. And he is so taken with her at this point. I mean, so taken. He's smitten, I believe. And, and she tells him, she's like, all of my people are set to be wiped out, to be destroyed. And he says, how? Like he's appalled. Can he? he signed off on it, but he had no idea who she was or where she came from. And he was furious. And she turns and she says, Haman is the one who has orchestrated this whole thing, right? Isn't this such a fun story? I just think it's such a fun story. And so her courage is, is, is like allowing her people to be set free because what happens is, Haman is killed that night. He's hung on gallows that he had set up for Mordecai. He's killed and his sons are killed too. And then Mordecai is given Haman's position as the king's right-hand man. So now everything is turning, right? So we see the courage of one young girl. One young girl who refused to be silent when it was her time to stand. This is royalty like no other. Will we have the courage and the boldness to do the thing that God calls us to do in the right moment? We have to. Because the entire nation was riding on her decision to follow through or not. 
So what they, what they told the king, they were like, here's what we could do. Because he couldn't go back on his word. But what he could do was issue another decree to announce to all the Jewish people what was going to happen so that they could be prepared for this battle when it came. This, it's such a fascinating story of how these people are in captivity, right? And because of one person's decision to stand up and be who she was called to be, freed them. You guys, on the day that this battle was to take place to where the Jewish people were to be wiped out, the tables were turned. They were prepared and there were more with them than there were against them. And they slaughtered all of their enemies. Wow. It's fascinating what one brave yes can do. The thing is, is that we don't know who we are, right? We forget. We forget who we are. We allow all of the circumstances that surround us to dictate, to tell us, to whisper in our ear who we are instead of listening to the one who authored us in the first place. One decision freed an entire people group. That's amazing. So you just don't know what your one yes is actually going to mean for those around you. You don't. I think that we should become audacious enough to begin to wonder, at least, what could my yes mean for those around me? What could my decision to go all in mean for those around me? It seems small, but what could my decision for gathering people up here for prayer mean for all of us? I don't know. Esther didn't know. Esther didn't know whether she would live or die by going before the king. But not only did she live, so did the entire nation. All of her people lived that day because of her bravery. And the story goes that because of this battle won, they celebrate a tradition called Purim. And what they do at this festival, and I find this very fascinating, it's a festival that goes on for days. And they will drink until they no longer can remember the name of their enemy, Haman. Now, I'm not authorizing drunkenness. But what I am saying is that we need to become so intoxicated on the goodness of God that we forget the name of our defeated enemy, I might add, so that we can no longer hear the voice of the defeated enemy, so that we can no longer become so obsessed with the defeated enemy's tactics. Can we become so intoxicated on the goodness of God that we pay no attention to the enemy that has already been defeated. Say he's defeated. What are we doing? Right? What are we doing? The enemy has already been defeated. We have already been set up as heiresses. We've already sat down on our thrones. It's up to us. It says actually in here, I forgot this part, but I think it's a beautiful scene. Before she went before the king, she put on her royal robes. Do you put on your royal robes when you're about to do something important? What does that look like? We need to have a routine. What does it look like for you? For me, I'm always wanting to be lost in a space of worship. I want, like, I love that Robin went there before she got started here tonight, where she was like, I just want us to ascribe worth to his name. 
I want us to remember who it is that we're talking to, that we're worshiping. I want to remember. What is he capable of doing? Or if I'm preparing every day, I start listening to as many things that I can that talk about how big he is. Oh, you want to hear one of the stories? I'll tell you one of the stories. This is really good. I was listening to an interview with Che On and Bill Johnson, and they were sharing stories. You can only imagine what these stories are like because they both have been in the business for quite some time, and they've seen Things happen. Bill Johnson just so casually says, this healing business has just become everyday life. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. I want to be able to someday say this healing stuff, this raising the dead thing, it's just become everyday life. This is just ordinary for us. I want to be able to say that. But that's not the story I want to tell you. So Che was saying, he was telling him about a story because they were sharing stories back and forth, healing stories, miracle stories. And this one in particular was fascinating to me. He was talking about, um, I, I cannot remember the name of the guy, that um, was doing like this whole healing thing. And these parents brought from Sweden had brought their kid up to be healed. He was born without ears. And to me, he sounded like toddler age. They didn't really give the age, but that's what it sounded like to me. And he said that whoever it was, I think it was John Paul Jackson. Is that a right name? John Paul Jackson? Is that right? Anyway, that's who I think it is. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, so he says that he prayed over the kid, but had no faith for it. Had no faith that ears would just grow out. And so, you know, he just kind of went through the motion, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for new ears, whatever it is that he does. And um, it wasn't until later they had returned back to their country and they were sitting down at the table eating with their child, these parents, and one on each side of them. And all of a sudden they got really quiet and they started looking at each other, looking back at the kid, ears started growing out of the side of the little guy's head. Ears! I mean, I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, there's there's no ears, and then suddenly there's like blossoming out of the side of his head. <laughs> I mean, listen, and, and I'm someone who likes to like watch plants as if I'm watching them grow. They don't move while I'm sitting there, but I just like to adore them. These are ears growing out of the side of this kid's head. These are the kinds of things that we have to feed ourselves to remember, to be able to rightly ascribe worth to his name. Because the robes that we have access to right now, it's not, it's not the full thing, guys. See, the more, the more that we we understand who he is and what he's capable of doing, the more bougie our royal robes get. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> Maybe they're more bedazzled. I don't really know. But you know what I'm saying? Like, they mean something when we put them on. See, if, if Esther would have gone before the king without her royal robes on, I'm not certain that he would have extended his scepter to her. I'm not sure it would have happened, but it was because she came with the assurance of who she was that the king was like, oh yeah. Right? Like who could deny her? And I think that's the same for you and I. It's like when we put on the full dress, who wouldn't extend their scepter? This is actually a word that's been prophesied over me. Whoo, just hit me. Years ago, someone said this to me. Oh, you're like Esther. And there will never be a time that the gold scepter isn't extended towards you. I know, what a word. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for that reminder. Did you see my royal robes? They just kind of got shinier. <laughs> it's just important for us to know who we are. It is. It's really important, but we can't fully know who we are unless we know who he is and what he's capable of. 
if he can grow ears just like that, you know how creepy that would have been? I mean, we've watched a leg grow out about an inch. And that, and see, we couldn't even like see it actually growing. We had to measure it to know that it, it grew anyway. Right. And, and we did watch Christy's leg grow out once. That was fascinating. Oh, yes. And my finger's been, see, we have to talk about this stuff. We have to remember. We have to remember what he's done. And we wonder, we often wonder, why does he do things like give people gold teeth? Or why do we get gold dust on our hands or oil coming out of our fingertips? To make you wonder. You know? He is wonderful. He is wonderful. And there's just no end to what he can do because he's always going to be the most creative being in the room. Always. Always. He will always be the most creative one in any room. There's nothing he can't do. He thought all this up in the first place all by himself. He didn't survey anyone first. Hey, what do you think about this? He's just like, I got an idea. Let's make people in our likeness. And let's blow their mind every once in a while with how great we are. We need to know who he is. So my whole thing in like, what does it look like for you to be preparing yourself like Esther, you know, 12 months of beauty treatments. What does that look like for you? How are you preparing yourself to give your yes? Oftentimes the reason why we don't fully give our yes is because we don't fully know him. Let's know him so that we can rightly ascribe worth to his name, so that we can rightly wear these royal robes. Yes? All right, that's really all I have, ladies. I just think there's nothing left to do than to worship. And like really worship, you know? Like, let's, let's do this, you know? I just think sometimes we're so familiar with these spaces that we forget that we're supposed to actually, like, let's go somewhere. Right. I want to see things happen. I do. I want to see God do great and glorious things. Yeah, I know you do. I know. Yeah. Our, our job is to pull on the unseen realm. Use your imagination. What does he have out there that is for you that you can pull on and begin to make it manifest for all of us to enjoy? Yeah? Can you, let's just, let's stand up. Just stand up. Mm, Jesus. Well, we now know that you are the healer and you do crazy things like grow ears out. And we are ready to have our minds blown. Just ready, Jesus. We're ready. We're ready to see you do something. To do marvelous things in our presence. And not just to entertain us, though we are, so we can rightly ascribe worth to who you are. You are worthy. You're so worthy. Graham Cook says this. He says, Jesus is worthy of having your prayers answered. Jesus is worthy of having your prayers answered. What a statement. Jesus is worthy of having 
your prayers answered. See, that takes off the table the wonderings of, does he want to heal me? Is it his will to heal me? Jesus deserves to have your prayers answered. So if you have a need, Jesus is worthy to have your prayers answered. So as we worship, I want you to get brave and start throwing the things out there that you need, right? Let's just believe that he's worthy to have his prayers answered. Yeah? All right, guys.